A year has passed since the most controversial finish in the history of the Daytona 500, when Eric Almirola was turned into the wall in the backstretch on the final lap by Austin Dillon. Dillon would go on to win the race and would later admit that the wreck was intentional on his part. This move would fracture the fan base, fans taking either side of the issue of the debate and uh, defining whether or not it was a good or a right or a justified move for Austin Dillon to win the NASCAR uh, biggest or NASCAR's biggest prize in such a way. So a year later, what we're going to do here is kind of analyze this with the aid of a little bit of uh, hindsight and time in between the, uh, the accident and now where we are. Do we still feel the same way about Austin Dillon's actions on the final lap of the Daytona 500? And also we're going to take a look at some of the things that maybe either contributed to the accident itself or at least kind of the, the justification for why it happened, kind of the fascination of the Daytona 500, more so than virtually any other crown jewel motorsport event with accidents and crashes, almost defining the event to a certain extent. And we're also going to talk about that argument. And if you don't know what that argument is, it's the Dale Sr. argument. Would Dale Sr. have actually wrecked someone on the last lap of the Daytona 500? That's what we're going to try to talk about and uh, kind of define at the end of this video. But first, we're going to talk a little bit about exactly what transpired at the end of the Daytona 500 that year. Now, straight up, I'm going to tell you my opinion. It has not changed from when I uh, looked at this accident a year ago in that uh, I believe it was a dirty move for Austin Dillon to do Eric Almirola particularly that way. Um, there really wasn't an excuse, in my opinion, uh, to turn him there. It wasn't like Eric Almirola really w was blocking it away that I felt was uh, grossly unjustified. There was, you know, there was room that uh, Austin Dillon could have gone with the run that he had. He didn't need to slam him in the rear, and certainly he didn't need to hook him going down the back straightaway. And, it, and again, it also wasn't like they're coming to the line. I mean, I, maybe some people could make some arguments. Uh, if you look at the 2013 uh, uh, Nationwide Series finish where Regan Smith got turned into the wall by Brad Keselowski, and that ended up putting a car nearly into the stands. But maybe some people would justify that because you're coming to the line and, oh, well, anything goes when you're 500 yards from the finish of a race. Um, I certainly wouldn't wouldn't define it that way, but some people may. But on the backstretch, really, uh, you know, when Austin Dillon got his initial run, he was about halfway down the backstretch, which was about halfway to the checkered flag. You know, to think that there wasn't necessarily, or that was the only opportunity he was going to get to pass Eric Almirola is a bit of an assumption. Of course, it's an assumption on the other side to say it was or it, it it was his only chance, or it wasn't his only chance. There's assumptions on both sides. But I would kind of err on the side of, you know, you had a, a lot of momentum behind you with guys like Denny Hamlin and uh, Bubba Wallace who could have theoretically pushed him past and you could have had a Mark Martin, uh, Kevin Harvick finish at the end of the Daytona 500 versus what you had. So in my opinion, it's, it's still dirty. And I know that's going to, you know, upset some people. But we're going to try to look at this, you know, in a lot of different layers, not just I'm not just going to sit here and spout virtue about whether or not Austin Dillon was right. Um, we're going to look at this a little bit more, or we're going to try to look at it more objectively, or at least try to add some perspective to it. So, when Eric Almirola was leading that Daytona 500 in the last lap, he had, you know, he didn't have a whole lot of options, and he's even since admitted Eric Almirola has talked about the fact that he doesn't hold a whole lot of resentment. In fact, it was the first interview he gave afterwards. He doesn't hold a whole lot of resentment towards Austin Dillon simply because of the fact that he almost expected to be wrecked coming to the line. Um, you know, and, and he was just doing whatever he could to stay in the lead because naturally restricted plate racing kind of puts you, puts you into that box where you're unable to you know, 
make or at least defend your position, especially if you kind of get a lead like uh, Eric Almirola did. He had, you know, a two or three car length lead coming out of turn two, and that allowed Austin Dillon to get the, the massive run and the push that he did that ultimately, you know, he got into the back of Eric Almirola. Now, looking at Austin Dillon, again, I look at it, you know, as the very first push maybe wasn't necessary. Um, I mean, if he was going to turn him, <laughs> you would think that in that first initial kind of a burst of energy that he had when I think he was getting pushed by uh, uh, Bubba Wallace. There were two purple cars there, so I may be mistaking one of them. But he was he got a huge push, and if he really wanted to turn Eric Almirola, maybe he should have gone to the inside and allowed Almirola to turn himself. But maybe that would have caused a lack of momentum for Austin Dillon, and that wouldn't have allowed him to ultimately win the race. Maybe we'd be talking about Bubba Wallace as the 2018 Daytona 500 winner. But, and this is kind of where we're going to get into the second part of this video. Because, in a lot of ways, this is not necessarily out of the ordinary for the Daytona 500. Despite the fact that, in my opinion, this is the only time we've really had a straight-up um, intentional crash uh, for the win, especially where the driver who crashed the guy actually benefited from crashing the guy. Uh, it's not necessarily unprecedented given the history of Daytona, a race defined by crashes. So that's going to set a lot of people. I think a lot of people are going to misinterpret what I, what I have to say here. So I'm going to try to keep it as brief as possible, but at the same time get my point across. So in a lot of ways, the Daytona 500 throughout its history has always been a race where, in a, in a lot of ways, the fans and the people who watch the event years later will remember the driver who had the biggest wreck rather than the driver who actually won the race. And in terms, like I mentioned at the beginning, in terms of major league races, ones that are kind of treated as the majors, uh, this is unique. I mean, you would expect that maybe at Bowman Gray Speedway where, wow, that guy had the biggest wreck of the night. You generally don't expect it at a race with the prestige level of something like Daytona, but that's where we are. Um, and if you don't believe me, um, ask general public who won the, uh, w which one you remember more, who won the 2003 Daytona 500 or who flipped through the grass on the main straightaway. Um, I would also argue that more people probably remember uh, Montoya hitting the jet dryer in 2012 than Matt Kenseth winning the race. It, it, this is just kind of how it goes. And... Uh, there was kind of a precedent set with the Daytona 500, especially in its mainstream popularity way back in 1979 when you had uh, Allison and, and Yarbrough crash on the back straightaway. And that's what a lot of people remember. Not so much that, uh, that Richard Petty managed to cross line first and actually end up winning the race. And so, you know, when general public was turning in for or tuning in to the 1980 Daytona 500, they were kind of expecting the wrecks. And I have to say that you look at Dale Earnhardt uh, and his crash in 2001, and I think that kind of reinforced a lot of the this kind of feeling around the Daytona 500 where there's always this expectation that there's going to be some sort of a, a major crash or a major pileup or something. And if the race doesn't have it, you actually see some backlash from the fans. What do I mean by that? Well just go back to around 2016 and look at some of the social media reaction to that race. Um, as kind of a purist racing fan, I think the 2016 Daytona 500 was one of the objectively best ones in the modern era, perhaps ever, uh, or not ever, but in the modern era, like in the Gen 5 to Gen 6 era of NASCAR, post Gen 4, I guess you could say. It's the best one. It's the most exciting. It's the cleanest. It's got the best finish. And yet, a lot of the fan base was upset because 35 cars or whatever it was were in that lead pack at the end and nobody flipped into the catch fence and there wasn't a 20 car pile up despite the fact that you had all this excitement and drama that built up throughout the 500 miles and then you had the uh, exciting finish. So it, it, it's weird but it's not unprecedented and it and it certainly fits into some NASCAR fans' expectations of what the Daytona 500 should be when a guy like Austin Dillon 
is willing to wreck a guy like Eric Almirola for the win. And we also have to consider that a lot of people liked last year's Daytona 500. This is why it was so divisive, because really you had the perfect Daytona 500 for, for a lot of people, and you had the worst possible Daytona 500 for a, a lot of other people, because it was a very chaotic race. There was a ton of accidents, a lot of cars getting torn up, and um, from that perspective, it was exciting. But unfortunately, you get to the end of the race where you have all the guys who have survived, and they still wreck each other <laughs> coming to the finish. So... When when you look at the history, and it's so weird too, because and I and I really think you should you should think about that that uh, analogy I made, where you look at the Daytona 500s that have come in the past, and as the collective consciousness of the general public or even just NASCAR fans in general has kind of faded, what is what has defined each Daytona 500? I mean, just look at the Fox uh, highlights packages. When they again, when they show the 2003 Daytona 500, they don't show Michael Waltrip winning under a rain delay. They show uh, Ryan Newman flipping through the grass. I think there's something to that, and I think that's why you have this uh, kind of visceral reaction uh, to the Daytona 500 in particular. So finally, we're going to talk about the Dale argument, and this was the kind of number one defense of the people who liked or thought Austin Dillon's uh, actions at the end of last year's Daytona 500 were justified. They said, well, Dale would have done it. Well, yes and no. And I actually originally was going into this video about to give you a hard no on this one, and I'll explain later. But first of all, I will say mostly it's a no that Dale would not have done something like this, wrecked somebody at a plate track for a win. We've kind of put Dale Earnhardt on a pedestal since his untimely death. It's not really a surprise. Uh, people generally deify the dead, especially when um, it happens on such a high-profile stage. He's such a high-profile driver. It happened at kind of a watershed moment for NASCAR. So when people talk about Dale Earnhardt, you have to take a lot of it with a grain of salt. And kind of this... Uh, this aura around Dale Earnhardt that he was willing to wreck people for wins, very few and far between. There's maybe a handful to maybe two handfuls of examples where Dale Earnhardt was willing to wreck people for wins, and probably even less than that where the intention was actually there to go out and spin the guy out. And a lot of people forget, maybe because they're too young or maybe because they're too old and they've forgotten, but uh, when Dale Earnhardt wrecked people, it wasn't completely well received. In fact, it usually didn't have a positive connotation. In fact, when Dale Earnhardt uh, famously wrecked Terry Labonte to win that Bristol race in 1999, he was booed in victory lane. So that goes to tell you that, he, you know, in terms of a popularity contest, he was not Dale Earnhardt Jr. He was more Kyle Busch. And this is where people, again, kind of forget because we've deified so much. We've put such a emphasis on Dale Earnhardt and who he was or who people thought he was that we don't remember that, yes, he was involved in a crash on a plate track at the end of the 93 Talladega race where Rusty Wallace ended up crashing and flipping. What people forget is that Dale Earnhardt drove back around at about 180 miles an hour and stopped to see if Rusty was okay. Do you think Austin Dillon did that with Eric Almirola? Sure, it's a slightly different situation, but um, it's, it's kind of cut from the same cloth. A guy wrecks another guy on the last lap. Does he stop to see if he's okay? No, he probably drives right into victory lane. And unfortunately, a lot of these comparisons are made because of the three car. People look at Austin Dillon, and for whatever reason, probably because it's a partially black three car, they see Dale Earnhardt. And was Dale Earnhardt ever willing to go to the lengths that Austin Dillon was to win a race at a plate track? And the answer is no, but there was a situation, thanks to my pal Frisky Nixon for uploading this clip, uh, that is similar to this. It happened in an IROC race in the 90s. Last lap, back straight away. It's only at Talladega rather than Daytona, but Alan Jr. is leading the race and uh, is blocking, just like Eric Almirola, gets turned uh, off of Earnhardt's front bumper, goes into the wall. Very similar situation. Earnhardt goes on to win the race. The difference here is that Earnhardt clearly holds his line 
and Unser Jr. pretty clearly wrecks himself based upon what we know from what the drivers have said is general plate racing etiquette, meaning if you're blocking, you better be prepared for the consequences. And yes, I'm well aware that Eric Almarola was blocking. He's admitted to doing it. The videotape is very clear that he was blocking. That being said, I don't think the blocking moves that Eric Almarola made were necessarily nearly late enough or nearly aggressive enough to justify being wrecked or justify the fact that he got turned. If you look, if you watch the video of Eric Almarola making those moves, he makes them very early, and Austin Dillon makes almost no kind of reactionary move to try to get away from the block. He just drives right into the back of him both times Eric Almarola makes a block. That definitely shows an intention, in my opinion, that he was willing to. Uh, to, to wreck him. And it's not even an opinion because he straight up admitted it. I should stop saying in my opinion. He absolutely had the intention of driving Eric Amarola into the wall, which he did. So, I don't know. It, it, it was a dirty move, but at the same time, I would not be surprised in the least if this year's Daytona 500 ends in a very similar circumstance where you have another driver getting turned into the wall on the last lap and another driver uh, manages to benefit from that and takes the win. I don't know. I'm sure you've already let me know what you think in the comments section. I, I don't know. What do you think of my analysis of this situation? Do you think I'm right? Do you think I'm wrong? Do you think I'm barking up the wrong tree? Do you think I'm opening up old wounds? Maybe. I think the one thing we can all agree on is that Austin Dillon uh, should have absolutely been disqualified, not because he spun Eric Almirola out, but because he dabbed after the uh, burnout. That was way over the line, regardless of how you feel about him crashing Eric Almirola. So, thank you guys so much for watching. This has been David Land on YouTube. Subscribe for more NASCAR and motorsport content, and we'll see you in the next video.